on behalf of CMRE School of Law, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our dignitary and guest speaker for today, Mr. Harish Shaktiyan, sir. I'm delighted to welcome Anil Ali, sir, Harish Shaktiyani, sir, Shobha Shaktiyani, ma'am, and and our respected director, Madhima Ma'am, teachers, staff, and my dear students. As John, Whit Whit John Henry Whitmore has rightly quoted that cross-examination is the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of truth. You can do anything with a bayonet except sit on it. A lawyer can do anything with cross-examination if he is skillful enough not to impale his own cause upon it. I would now request all the dignitaries to kindly light the auspicious lamp and commence the evening. Thank you. May I now request Nesma ma'am to give the welcoming address. Guest speaker for today's function, Mr. Harish Jatyani, founding members of DM Harish School of Law, Ali Harish sir, and ma'am Shobha Jatyani. All assembled here, a very good morning to everyone. The art of cross-examination is not the art of examining a witness crossly. It is the art of leading a witness through a line of propositions to which he agrees until he is forced to agree to that one fatal question. Cross-examination is an art, it is a science, and more importantly, it is a vital, loyally skill. So how do we acquire this skill? We are fortunate that this morning, we have amidst us a master, a captain, who is going to teach us to navigate the turbulent waters of this meandering river of cross-examination. On behalf of DM Hari School of Law, HSNC University, and all assembled here, I extend a very huge and a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Mr. Harish Jatya. Let us also welcome the founding members of this school, Mr. Amir Harish and Ms. Mrs. Shobha Jatya. The very presence of the founding members is very reassuring and motivating. Now, without wasting any time, let us embark on this intriguing voyage of cross-examination. Thank you. May I now request Nelima Ma'am to facilitate our guest round.
I now request Tanish Boyal to introduce our guest speaker. Mr. Hari Chaktiani. Mr. Hari Chaktiani is an advocate with extensive experience in litigation and arbitration. He is the founder of the law firm Hari Chaktiani and Associates, which is now called Oasis Council and Advisory. Mr. Chaktiani completed his LLM in Constitutional and International Law in 1971 and was designated as Senior Advocate in India in 1994. Mr. Chaktiani is a member of the Supreme Court Bar Association of India, the Bombay Bar Association, and the Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa. He is also the member of the Board of Trustees of ING Investment Management and the Indian Division of ING Bank, among other institutions. During the course of his career, Mr. Jaktiani has been counsel for several large foreign and Indian banks and multinational corporations. Also was appointed as an independent director on the board of Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited. Mr. Jaktiani has represented clients in commercial, criminal, civil, maritime, and matrimonial disputes, as well as in disputes relating to income tax, power and electricity, intellectual property rights, customs and excise, and other indirect taxes. Mr. Jaktiani also successfully represented clients at various fora, including the Indian Council of Arbitration, the International Chamber of Commerce, the London Court of International Arbitration, the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, and the Dubai International Arbitration Centre. Mr. Jaktiani's corporate clients have included prominent names such as Unitech, Pantaloon Retail, Indian Overseas Bank, Oriental Bank of Commerce, BNP Parihas, Crompton Greaves, Cable Corporation of India, and Lupin. Mr. Hari Chaktiani has also represented numerous public figures, including Sri late Madhav Rao cricketers Sachin Tendulkar and Mohinder Amarnath, jockey Pes Pesi Shroff, and film personalities to name a few. Thank you. Thank you, Danish. I would now like to request Mr. Harish Jaktiani, sir, to address the students who are equal to you. Yep. It's wonderful being back as a, in this capacity. I was a professor of government law college many, many years ago. And I'll tell you, I told myself that I would much rather love a judge and love a student and get away with it. It's, it's, really, it's really a wonderful place to have gone through. That's the academics because when you're actually instructing a class, you have to have such a vast reserve fund of knowledge so that you can navigate your way through your lecture. And that's absolutely essential. And I remember, of course, in those days, I was quite briefless <laughs> way back when I just joined the profession. But I wouldn't spare any effort. I'd probably spend four or five hours preparing for a 45-minute lecture because I loved it so much. So thank you for having me here. It's really wonderful to be back in a classroom. Now, let me ask you for a few moments. I'm, I'm referring to the boys here in this class. Of course, all of you are so young. None of you have made the mistake of getting married by now, have you? <laughs> Anyone? All right, so now... You know, whenever you come home late without informing your wife, you must know what cross-examination is going to happen. <laughs> because she would have a way of ferreting the truth out of you. That's it. And therefore, I personally believe that ladies would probably end up making better cross-examiners because they know how to ferret the truth. Although, of course, some of the methods that they use may not pass muster vis-a-vis -vis the evidence act. It may not be approved by the evidence act. But be that as it may, the basis of cross-examination is basically how you arrive at the truth in a given situation, especially in a, I mean, in a trial. 
Now, the truth, for instance, I mean, if I could give, it, give, give an analogy, think a block of stone. Now, in any block of stone, there would be in it a magnificent sculpture waiting to be chiseled out. It's a block of stone, ultimately, when properly chiseled or when expertly chiseled, gives you, let's say, sculptures like Rodin's Thinker, which are then, you know, which are immortal as works of art. But how do you do it? You have to chip away the stone, bit by bit, bit by bit, till it reveals the magnificent work of art that is in it. That's what cross-examination is all about. It's chipping away at a witness till you get close to the truth. However, when we are talking about the truth in the context of a trial, be it civil, be it criminal, you're talking about the truth that has to meet with the requirements of the Evidence Act. And unless it meets with the requirements of the Evidence Act, it can't be looked into by a judge. It's what is known as inadmissible in terms of the material before with the judge on the basis of which he form a judgment. So therefore, I look at the Evidence Act as a means of arriving at the truth, but this is processed truth. It has to be processed through the various provisions of the Evidence Act. And I know that you're not studying the Evidence Act yet because it comes in a later year, but there are some fundamental principles of the Evidence Act which run through your entire legal career. You can't get away from it. The importance of this was recognized by Mahatma Gandhi and he knew the Evidence Act by heart. And let me tell you something, which I, if you, if you keep this, if you keep this at the back of your mind, anyone who masters the Evidence Act will have an edge over his opponent, if, especially if the other person is not so well informed about it. So it is an extremely important act. Now, for instance, when I told you that this is a process truth, what do I mean by that? For instance, if someone comes in the box and deposes to a fact that he hasn't himself seen or has himself witnessed, it's known as hearsay evidence. And hearsay evidence is not admissible in evidence. It doesn't matter how credible it may be. Just to give an example, and I've given this example a few times, let's suppose who are the most honest people you, history has known. Okay, Mahatma Gandhi goes into the box and he deposes to a fact that he'd seen such and such a thing happen. And the cross examiner asks him, How do you know? <laughs> well, he says, My source is from Yudhishthira, who never told a lie. The judge will look at him and say, that, Look, I have every reason to believe you, but I'm sorry. Unless Yudhishthira comes to the box and says this is what he saw, your version of what he saw is not admissible in evidence because it is hearsay. Now, this is what you have to keep in mind that when you're cross examining someone, it must necessarily pass muster vis a vis the evidence act. Now, let me tell you there are a couple of, in, there are a couple of definitions. I'm not going to get into it in any depth, which you must know. It's rudimentary and it will help you through your other studies as well. For instance, what is a fact? A fact is any state of things or a state of things related to the other. And this also includes a state of mind. So that also is a fact. So for instance, a person entertains a certain opinion. That's a state of mind. That is a fact. An opinion is also a fact. Keep this in mind. Now, the other definition that one has to be mindful about is what is proof? Because when is a fact said to be proved? Now, this is an extremely important definition because it is said to be proved when the judge listening to a case accepts it as correct, looking to all the surrounding factors and X. Uh, accepts that to be proved or the alternate test is very very interesting is 
Would a prudent man, a man of ordinary prudence, act on the supposition that that fact exists? So the test goes away from just a judge who's an expert in many cases, but a better field of things, to applying the test of a prudent man. Now, this assumes tremendous importance because what a prudent man would accept in a situation will depend upon the nature of the burden that a litigant has to provide in a case. Now, let me just dwell on this very, very briefly, and I'm not going to get heavy on this. What is burden of proof? Burden of proof is this, that when a person goes to a court with a case, he has to prove that case is there, that case exists. But those facts which go up to make that, that situation are really facts which exist. Now, the burden would depend upon the nature of the trial. What do I mean by this? If, for instance, it's a civil case where you're making a, a claim for damages against another person, then you need evidence. And the burden that he has to discharge in order to be entitled to his relief has to be better than the burden, than, than the proof which is provided by the other side. So this is known as proving your case on a preponderance of probabilities, which means these facts that you introduce are better or more reliable than the facts introduced by the other side. So in a civil trial, you prove a case on the basis of preponderance of probability. But in a criminal trial, because the consequences are serious on the person against whom you prove those cases, you have to prove that case beyond reasonable doubt. Now, this is the nature of burden. It's very, very important to keep some of these principles in mind because when I get into the question of cross-examination, how one goes into it, I will dilate on some of the principles that you have to keep in mind. Now, just to illustrate this whole idea of burden of proof, take the famous trial of O.J. Simpson. You've probably heard about it. The great footballer, the soccer player, uh, football, I think he was in America. He was tried for killing his ex wife and her lover. That was the nature. Now, the matter went to a jury trial, and at the end of the trial, the jury gave a split version and said that the proof, the evidence was not good enough to prove the case of murder against him. They said it was tainted with racialism, whatever it is. The jury, therefore, did not give a unanimous decision, and as a result, he was acquitted. But the parents of his ex-wife sued O.J. Simpson in a civil case for damages for causing death of a kid, a daughter. And in the same case, on the same facts, the jury gave a verdict of guilty against O.J. Simpson. Now see this, see the dichotomy in this. Because the burden which is required in a criminal trial is much heavier. The consequences could be that O.J. Simpson would probably hang or go to jail for life if it was proved. But in a civil trial, the evidence which was led on behalf of the parents was better than the evidence of the other side. And therefore, the test of a prudent man was applied. Would a prudent man evaluate the evidence before him, how would he do it? Therefore, if he has to judge it in the context of a criminal trial, he would then be more cautious because the consequences are serious. On the other hand, he would not, I would say, throw caution to the winds, but he would evaluate it more in a different way. So therefore, this is what, uh, you know, what, what has to be kept in mind in your process of cross-examination. Because all these become very, very vital in the type of questions that you must ask the witness, keeping in mind what is it that you're trying to get out of him. There are two other sections that I must uh, talk about under the Evidence Act before I get into the principles of this examination. One is Section 105 of the Evidence Act. It's an important section. It's like this. For instance, if a person is charged, with a criminal offense, say murder, whatever. And he admits 
to the fact of killing a person or the other person who is accused of having murder. But having said that, yes, I did commit this act, but I had a reason to do it. It was because I was, I, there was grave and sudden provocation. Or he may say that I did it in the right of my self-defense. That person was attacking me. I therefore, in the process of defending myself, I, I, I killed him in the process. Now, this is in the section 105 says, when you admit an act, but you then say that that act doesn't amount to a criminal offense, or it's a lesser form of a criminal offense, then you are pleading an exception to that fact. Now, when you plead an exception to a fact, then the burden lies upon the person who's pleading the exception. Then the accused person will have to say, well, what I did, I did in one of the exceptions to the offense. Keep this in mind because I'm, one of the instances that I give you, this has something to do with it. Then the other section that one may have to uh, keep, when you have to keep in mind to make the whole process of cross-examination uh, intelligible is section 106 of the evidence act. What is section 106 say? That if a fact resides in the special knowledge of a person, then it is for that person to prove that fact. For instance, you're traveling in a train. Question is whether you have bought a ticket or not. Now, it's not for the ticket collector to prove that you did not buy a ticket, because whether you bought a ticket or not is within the special knowledge of the passenger. So the passenger will have to say, prove that he bought the ticket, simply because it's very difficult to prove the negative. These are just a couple of things that you will have to keep in mind when I tell you about it. One last factor is that when you're cross-examining, remember the provisions of law provide for when you treat a fact as being an admitted fact. If it is an admitted fact, or if it's a confession which is made by the person who's under trial, then that fact need not be proved. You don't have to elicit it through the process of cross-examination. You don't do that. You don't ask questions. If it's an admitted position, leave it. Leave it as it is. Now it is said, that when you're cross-examining a witness, you must treat the witness as a serpent. Grown as a son, why do they say that? Because in the process of getting your truth out, you must, and you're going to nab or catch a serpent, how do you do it? You can't catch it by the tail because he'll turn around and snipe at you. So therefore you have to be so deaf that if you're catching a snake, you catch it at its neck. So the snake becomes helpless. Now, this is how the analogy goes. And these are, these are the, some of the, I've mentioned some of these rules only to tell you that cross-examination really is an art, but it's no fluke. There is no fluke. If you're going to get into a trial and expect that the witness will oblige you by giving favorable answers to you, well, your chances are better if you buy a lottery ticket. That is your chances are far better at succeeding in that. Because remember, every witness over there is out to prove his point, and he's not going to give, uh, give things on, you know, on a platter to you. Now come to some of the principles of cross-examination. Having said this, let me illustrate a few. Now these are principles which you won't find in any book. Any person who's practiced as as long as I have, or maybe a few years left, less of being more intelligent than me. Now, such a person will evolve his own principles of cross-examination. And some of these principles are very, very salutary, which will hold you in good stead. One of the first principles that I think must be born in mind, born in mind is that never ask the witness a question the answer of which you do not know or cannot anticipate. 
The reason being this, that in a trial, you're not there to learn from the witness. You're not going there to gain your gain general knowledge. You're there to take him in a direction where he commits himself to a position. So you never ask a question, but the answer of which you do not know. And for that, you must then lead the witness into a situation. Now, let me again, once in a while, tell you why I use the word lead. Questions can be of two sorts. Questions can be open-ended questions, like asking him, what, what, what time did you get there? What did you do here? How do you explain this? These are open-ended questions. But a leading question is where you put the answer in the mouth of the witness. You know, for instance, you don't say, what time did you get to the scene, to whatever the scene of offense is. And leave it to him to give you a time. Rather than that, if you want a precise time, you say, the leading question is, you appeared at that particular scene at 10 30 a.m. Is it right or wrong? Confirm that fact. That's a leading question. Now, there are certain constraints in this, and I'm mentioning this because when you're examining a witness in chief, when you, let's say he's your witness and you're reading him, you can't lead him. Leading questions are asked only in cross examination, and this is an all important circumstance that you must keep in mind. Now, let me give you a couple of other principles. For instance, when you're asking a witness certain questions and the response that you get from him is sufficient for you to argue your case and carry your point of view across within the scope of the burden that is on you, the burden of good principles that I gave you. Now, if you are able to get your elicit certain answers on the basis of which you can argue your case, keep your mouth shut. This is my advice to the cross examiner. Because as they say, the graveyard is full of lawyers who ask an extra question, who couldn't resist the temptation of asking an extra question. Let me give you an example. There was a case where a person was tried for poisoning his wife by giving, administering some poison to her. And it also happened that that, that substance, that poisonous substance, I'm not talking about the case that was before this morning's paper. I think there was something similar about that, but except it was a wife who poisoned the husband. But that also happens. Well, now, in this case, what had happened was he was high. Now, this poison in this particular case happened to be something which was available over the counter. It wasn't a prescription drug. And the person who was put in the box and who was being cross-examined was the chemist who had sold this poison to this particular person. Now, he was an important link because the prosecution had to prove that this poison had been purchased by him from this chemist. That was a critical thing. Now, in cross-examination, the cross-examination was a very good, very uh, adept cross-examination where the chemist stepped into the box and it went as follows. So he asked the chemist, you admit that this is a drug which is freely sold? He said, yes. And uh, it's not a prescription drug? He said, yes. He said, and where is your chemist shop? So he said, oh, it's in the corner of Oxford Street. A very famous shop. So, and he said, Oxford Street, I see that. So Oxford Street, there's a lot of people, hustle bustle people moving around over there. He said, yes. And he said, I dare say, asking chemists, that you get many customers coming every day. He says, yes. Now, what he was trying to establish in the cross-examination, and very, very well, was to show that it could be a case of mistaken identity. Then he asked him, you don't know this man personally, he's never met him before, just a customer, etc. So therefore, he was trying to say that this was a case of mistaken identity. He could make a mistake after so many people coming to his shop, buying a drug which is commonly sold, etc. Having got this information, he made the fatal mistake of asking the last question. Then how can you be sure you identified this man? To which his answer was, Sir, I was about to shut my shop. It was after hours. And this man came pleading that I need this drug desperately. And therefore, I had to open the shop, give it to him, and therefore I remember it was him. Now that extra question need not have been asked. 
Therefore, it, this last question enabled the chemist to fix the identity of this man that it was not during office hours, it was not during working hours, it was at a time. So this is where the principle is this, that when you get sufficient material to argue a case, don't push your luck. Don't ask the extra question. Because in a criminal trial in particular, it is sufficient for you to create a doubt in the evidence which is led. If a doubt is created, then you get what is known as the benefit of doubt. You must have heard this expression time and time again. Now, for instance, similarly, having said this, you can't be, you can't leave the cross-examination incomplete. Now, take another instance. This was a case where a railway company was being tried for negligence because there was a, a break in the in the tracks somewhere down the line, and the train nonetheless ignored the break in the tracks and got derailed as a result of which some passengers got injured. So a person who was injured brought an action against the railway company, saying this is a case of negligence. You ought to have alerted your the motorman or whoever was in guard, the guard ought to have alerted the train, the, the motorman from coming over there and you should have given him sufficient warning so he could put the brakes on his train. So the railway company said, yes, we had a watchman, we had a guard and from a long distance, he came much ahead of the brake in the rails and from a long distance, he was waving the lantern but the motorman ignored that and nonetheless went on. So on the basis of that, when he proved that he was waving a lantern, the railway company got away with it and the case of negligence was not proved. Now the fatal question that was not asked in this case was, was the lantern lit? As a matter of fact, it was that the lantern was not lit. So therefore, what's the point of waving a lantern which is not lit, how does it alert? So this is another instance where you must know how to complete your cross-examination. Then again, one of the other principles you may keep in mind is that the why question should be very, very sparingly used. In fact, never ask a why question if it's absolutely necessary. And why do I say that? Because the why question will give an intelligent witness an exit. You ask the why question only when you have covered all your tracks and there is no escape for the witness and that when he answers the why in a manner which is not to your liking, he is either committing a perjury or saying a lie or that why will get the information that you want from him. In cases that I have conducted, in fact there was one which in the context of an arbitration, I ended up asking six or seven hundred questions to the witness. And the first time I asked the why question was in my 500th question. Just keep completely away from it. This is a very prudent rule of cross-examination because don't keep your question so open-ended that the witness has an exit from it. Then another principle that one may keep in mind is that you must put the witness as far as possible in some sort of a comfort zone so he's not suspicious about where you're going or where you're taking them. And of course, if you can, then try as far as you can to pander to his ego so that he comes up with an answer that you want. Now, I'll give you an instance, and this is a rather interesting uh, case which I had an opportunity. In fact, this is my very, very early trials that I conducted. And it was a murder trial, and I must in my career, this is the only murder trial I've done in my career as a criminal lawyer. The facts were bizarre. The facts were that this young man, under the influence of drugs, and I'm not getting into the other gory details, but under the influence of drugs, he ended up committing a murder, and the murder was of none other than his own mother. Absolutely bizarre. Now he had a history. He had been institutionalized in mental institutes by the mother on various occasions, etc. 
But all this was every time he was institutionalized. And he came out we were in the institution when they detoxed him. He was perfectly normal, like any of us. Extremely well read, well educated, etc. But drugs had got the better of him. So this was a trial that he was facing. Now, on that fateful day, when the happened, it happened, he was home. He used to sleep on the streets. His mother didn't trust him in the night, but she would let him into the house in the morning. So he, he had come that morning. Once again, had taken pop some pills in his mouth just to be normal to the world. And then, at the house, some a fight broke out. A fight broke out. Uh, am I might tell you how it happened. She then gave him some money to buy vegetables. So he went out, bought some vegetables. But as he, as fate would have it, when he went to buy the vegetables, he met another druggy friend of his, who said. Do you have any money? And at that time, he had this vegetable money. So he said, let's take a fix. So they went to a sanitary, which is nearby. And both of them gave themselves an injectable shot. Now, by then, of course, he was completely zonked out. You, know, you can imagine. Before that, he had taken a few drugs in the morning. And then he takes a fix. So when he came home, his mother noticed that this had happened. So they got into a fight. Now, the fight happened in the kitchen. So what he did was... He took a knife and she said, I mean, she abused him, etc., whatever. So he took a knife and she threatened that she'll have him once again institutionalized. So he said, if you have that done, I'll kill you. And she taunted him once again, said, what, can you can't even kill a fly, you're useless. So he took a knife and plunged it in her. Now she was a robust lady, so she warded off the knife and went into her room. He found another knife. So she, he chased her. So then a fracas broke out and he inflicted wounds on her. 27 wounds. Out of them, three were fatal. When I say fatal, in the sense they were near those life fatal organs like the stomach, heart, lungs, etc. So they were, they needed kill. They were fatal. Anyway, then he realized, came to his senses. By then he had changed into his pajamas, so he changed back into his jeans. Whatever money he could find in the cupboard, he took that money. They were on the first floor of a building. He jumped over, scaled the wall, and got into a cab. You know, this is, this, this is not relevant to the this thing, but what he does is he gets into a cab, goes straight to Shuklaji Street, where drugs are sold, and gets another fix. That's a long be that as it may. So he, had a, he was chronic, he was completely an addict, etc. Shortly thereafter, he was caught at the police because they sprinted to drag him. Now, when that fight took place in the house, he hadn't finished her off. She was still alive. And a lot of, it was a, it was a, a big building. It was a crowded society. So a lot of people had gathered outside. So she crawled from the room, opened the door and let these people in. And immediately they called the control room, the police came, and the investigating officer was a very celebrated officer, one Mr. Zende, who, I don't know, if, have you heard the name Charles Sobraj? You must have heard him, right? He is the one who actually nabbed Charles Sobraj, so he became a celebrity thereafter. So he was a witness. Now, all these like, now what had happened was, in the process, there were about 212 patches of blood all over the place. Those are the blotches. And they discovered two knives. Now the prosecution, in its probably, obviously in its slipshod investigation, they took the knives and sent it to the laboratory for testing. They found that one had human blood on it. One had, sorry, the blood which, uh, which matched the mother's blood. So obviously that was an instrument which was used in the killing. The other knife had human blood, but wasn't tested whose blood it was. Similarly, they tested the two knives for fingerprints. One had the boy's, the, the, the son's fingerprint on it. The other was not tested for fingerprints. Now, these were the facts. These were the broad facts. Now, when the witness came to the box, <laughs> I had the pleasure of cross-examining him. I asked him a few questions in this nature. 
I said, Inspector Zengde, you came on the scene shortly after that they were called. He said, yes, I came within the shortest time possible. And uh, I said, then I have some preparatory questions. I said, you know, how many criminal trials have you done of the soil? Oh, hundreds of them. And I said, well, you're not only familiar with the forensic part of it, but you obviously are also familiar with the law on the subject. He said, yes, yes, yes. I said, then you you also know that all killings, all, all acts of killing need not necessarily be homicidal. They could be, some could be accidental, some could be in the nature of self-defense. He says, yes, yes, I know. So I said, but when you carried out your investigation, your charge sheet says that you have charged him with murder. So therefore, you are now, you were sure that this was a case of murder. He says, it was absolutely open and shut to so all this, etc. So I said, and this investigation of yours, how long did it last? So he said it lasted a few months by the time we got the reports from. And I said, all through the investigation, you were sure that you were investigating a case of murder. And I used the murder about six, seven times in the course of cross-examination. So never once did he say anything else except that he was examining or he was investigating a case of murder. Now this comes from a man who knows the distinction between murder and other forms of homicide which do not amount to murder. So he has kept on saying, yes, I was investigating from start to Now, when it came to the final arguments, when it came to the final arguments, our arguments were based, were as follows. We said, look, this son has killed his mother. It's not a fact that he's denying. But look at this. There were two knives. Now, if there is no eyewitness, nothing precludes or rules out the possibility. There are three possibilities. One possibility is that the mother used both the knives, which is absurd, has to be ruled out. The second possibility is that my client, the accused, used both the knives. That's a distinct possibility. The third possibility is that each person used a knife each. Each one used a knife. Now, I said, the third possibility, unless it is ruled out on the facts of the case, you must then assume, because a person is presumed to be innocent unless his guilt is proven. So, unless you rule out that third possibility, and these possibilities exist on the basis of evidence which is being brought by the prosecution on record, I am entitled to the benefit of this third possibility, that each one used one knife. Now, to which also that there was an additional fact in my favor that in the process of killing his mother, he had injured himself. Now, that injury could be attributed to the knife which may have been used by the mother on him. So it was not ruled out. Now, the argument came on the investigation. I said, look at the investigation. This is an investigation by a seasoned officer who knows the distinction between uh, murder and other forms of killing which do not amount to murder. He has not ruled out the fact that this could be, may not be murder because his entire investigation is focused only on proving a case of murder. So it is a biased investigation. It is an investigation done with a jaundiced eye. And believe it or not, this argument was accepted by the court and the client got the benefit of the doubt and was acquitted only because the whole the manner in which the evidence had been brought on record was that it could not rule out the fact of self-defense. And largely because we were able to establish that the, the investigating officer was so completely jaundiced by the fact that he did refuse to investigate into any other circumstance. For instance, if the investigation showed that both the knives had the uh, son's fingerprint, then that argument is not available to us. Similarly, if both of them had the blood stains of the mother, both the knives and the blood stains of the mother, that argument is not available. But it's just the cockiness of the witness that really got him into trouble. So this is why I'm, uh, I have just said that one of the ways in which you can elicit this from a witness is to pander to his, his ego and give him, you know, make him answer this. And this must be done in the form of leading questions that you ask.
you don't ask him what do you think, was it this, was it that, he put the word murder in his mouth time and time again. There's another interesting principle that must be kept in mind, and I'll give you another instance. For instance, if a witness permits in the course of the cross-examination, if the evidence on record is capable of two conclusions, one which is favorable to the accused and one which is not favorable to him, once again, take advantage of the principle of benefit of doubt. Now, there's a very famous trial which happened in England, and this was the, the defense counsel was one of the most renowned Council or uh, Queen's Council in, in England. This was at the turn of the last century, but the name was Sir John Marshall Hall. John Marshall Hall was conducting a very interesting case, and it was a celebrated case where a, a lady, a single mother, gave birth to a child. Now, these were the Victorian days where society was very, very conservative. And being a single mother, unwed mother, giving birth to a child was something which would lead to ostracization. She would have been completely boycotted by the community. You know, England has been very, very uh, conservative in those times. So the trial was this. Now, the child was delivered by a midwife at, at home. And at the time when the child was delivered, she told the midnight, mid midwife, how can I get rid of this child? In anguish, she said, how can I get rid of it? Shortly thereafter, the child was found in a dustbin, it was a case of infanticide, so she was charged with infanticide. And the only witness was the midwife who went into the box and gave these circumstances. So the prosecution case was virtually open and shut. A single mother who was afraid of being ostracized by society, unwed, and when the child was born, she made the statement. So that statement, how can I get rid of the child, was construed as motive for uh, a motive for killing the child. The examination in chief by the prosecution was very brief. They just had to bring these two facts on record and it would be done. All eyes were on Sir John Marsh and Paul. How is he going to contradict the witness? How is he going to? He gets up and says, no cross-examination. No cross. Everyone, there was a gas. He lost his marbles. I mean, that means his, his client is certainly. And those days, every offense in England, the most minor offense in England was punishable with hanging. It's in fact said that including pickpocketing. Pickpocketing also, there were 127 offenses in England at that time, which were all punishable with death including pickpocketing. And these hangings are all public hangings. In fact, at some of these public hangings, the maximum amount of pickpocketing is there. But the fact of the matter is that we a largely attended, obviously a bloodthirsty society, but be that as it may, this was England at that time. Now, when John Marshall Hall gets up and says, no cross-examination has been thought that he lost it. So when it came to arguments, the arguments was, the prosecution said, motive is established, single mother, etc., 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 and it turns to a defense counsel for his. She said, what evidence does the prosecution have? The prosecution, nobody has seen her giving the child. All that they have is a statement of a midwife who says, how can I get rid of this child? He says, you're reading this, the prosecution is relying upon the statement, as establishing motive. So if it's not so, look at the same statement differently. Here is a mother who is now anguished that for the rest of her life, she'll have to carry the stigma of being an unwed mother and bring up this child. So she is expressing an anguish. How can I get rid of this child? Which means I'm stuck with this child for the rest of my life. So she's only expressing her helplessness now, that is the interpretation to this phrase, how can I get rid of my child? The prosecution looks upon it as motive, and the, the accused is now expressing a state of helplessness. So unless there was direct evidence, he got an acquittal on the basis of that. Now, this is another principle, therefore, I illustrate to this, that this 
tells you when, if two possibilities open up in the course of a trial, then if it helps the prosecution, don't push your heart. Keep quiet. Make use of that. Now, unless therefore, yeah, I've done it. Now, a couple of other indications. Remember, a witness of untruth who's lying, a deaf cross examiner, a person who's done his homework, he must necessarily, he ought to be able to break the witness down. Now, you know, when you get into across the whole area of cross examination, the first thing that I advise my, my students, etc., is that. Study the case so thoroughly and fix the defense in your mind right at the very outset. Don't leave, leave it to chance that the defense that you may have coming in your favor will somehow show its actual surface in the course of the trial. It never happens. Like I told you, there are no clues in this. So know your defense. So if you know your defense right in the beginning, your questions will be directed so as to elicit, so as to establish the defense as you go along. Now, usually, therefore, a witness who speaks the, uh, the untruth, you ought to be able to put it down. Conversely, it's very, very difficult to break a witness who is truthful, otherwise truthful. The best you can do over there is to try and obfuscate the issue, confuse it. But these are some things to be kept in mind because then your questions will be phrased accordingly whether you are dealing with a person who is untruthful or a person who is truthful. Now, always, as I told you earlier, prefer leading questions to asking open-ended questions. Uh, it's amusing. I don't know if any of you have read Henry Cecil's novels. It's a must for all law students. There are actually stories are built around the law and the English law. Not strictly relevant to this, but one of the books opens with a question like this: A lady is in the box, and uh, and the person, the, the cross examiner asks her. Book opens this way. He says, "You say you have never had, or you have not had, an adulterous relationship with my client. Why not?" The whole courtroom is a gas. And of course, the rest of the book goes, but the next chapter goes as to there's an objection raised by the other side. And he says the objection is overruled and he establishes why such a question is legitimate in the situation. But be that as it may, the book opens in this manner. But let me tell you something. There is a way in which you can, by asking a proper leading question, non plus the witness or put him really on shaky ground so that. It thereafter is like putty in your hands. I'll give you an instance. And this actually happened. I was defending a civil trial. I was defending, a, or rather, yes, a, a lady who would be sued for divorce by her husband. Now, they had separated for five or six years, and he was having an affair with his secretary and had a child, and a child born out of. Uh, from this secretary. This person was, he and he had the gumption, he had the nerve to file a suit for divorce against his wife on the grounds of desertion. He had left her. He wanted to make a justification that I left her because of her nature, etc., etc. He shacked up with the secretary, he had a child. Those are the facts which we were able to establish. Now, when he comes in the box, absolutely once again, full of himself. And when the cross examination started, the first question I asked him was, I said, Mr. So-and-so, please tell the judge that you're the biological father of an illegitimate child. It just completely nonplussed him. And he started floundering, looking all around. I said, look, is there something wrong with my grammar? Do I have to rephrase this question? And I rephrased it. I said, confirm it. And I said, look at the judge when you answer. And he looked at the judge. Yes. In the smallest whisper. From then on, he 
agreed to everything that we had to ask him. It, these are just some of these tactics that you use because a cross examiner is necessarily in command of the trial. And all this, like I keep saying over and over again, cannot come without absolute preparation. And that preparation must be so thorough. You must anticipate what the defenses are. What I normally do, and this is a good tip which I learned from one of those uh, cross examiners, your base that one Mr. Chari used. And uh, he said, look, what he does is when he gets a brief in his hand, he analyzes it and he finds that puts them in two columns. One are facts which must be denied if I have to get uh, you know, success for my client. On the other hand, he makes another column, which is facts which cannot be denied because there's so much overwhelming evidence to establish those facts that you can't deny them. Now, very often there's a conflict between facts that you must deny and facts that you cannot deny. Now, it's in the process of reconciling this that you come up with a defense, the best defense available to you. And you cannot enter the arena of cross-examination unless you're clear in your mind as to what your defense will be. Because as I said earlier, there is no proof, look at all. So this is one of the things that you must keep in mind. The other tip is that, yes, let me just come to another type of a witness that you may have. You may have a witness who's an expert in his area, for instance, an engineer or let's say uh, some forensic expert or, or yeah, take one of these persons. Now remember, an expert witness is someone who knows his area better than you. You're just a cross examiner and you're trying to pick up his trade and his, his area of expertise from what you've been instructed. But one has to be very, very careful in confronting an expert witness. Usually it's very, very prudent to get an expert of your own so as to be able to deal with him on his turn. In a matter, once again, in an arbitration that I had recently concluded, um, there was an expert witness who had given a copious 200-page report. And the allegation against my client was that in, he was a, it was a works contract and he had to build certain types of cylinders in which you could store gas. And that had to be made out of a certain grade because if you didn't make those cylinders in the manner, or those containers, in the manner which was prescribed by the agreement, then there was a danger that it would, and it was used to store petroleum products or, or petrol. So one had to have, have a specific grade and a certain grade for the cement was prescribed in the agreement. Now, some time later, when they took an inspection and took chips of that, of that cylinder or that panel, they found that it did not conform to the grade which was prescribed in the agreement. So, for instance, what was prescribed was, let's say, a grade of 30. On taking a sample, it, it was found that if the grade was 20, but the agreement said that you must use a grade of, of cement which conforms with, with 30. Now, the engineer had given a detailed report running into hundreds of pages in which he said that a sample being taken is a grade of 20. But then he also found that it's possible that a 30 grade cement could have been used, but if you, that may be a bit of effect in the agreement itself, that you may use 30, but over a period of time, it then comes down and gets reduced, etc. So that, and we also find that that grade of cement was, which was used at that, was safe. It could withstand uh, a lot of trauma, including earthquakes, etc. Now we found it prudent not to cross-examine it and the entire cross-examination we asked just about six or seven questions to get these basic things out and that found favor with the arbitrator he says look the agreement says you use this grade they have probably had used that grade but the resultant grade is this now the whole idea is this why i'm getting into some details is that that otherwise if you had gone into the report and gone thread there he would have i mean there was no way to break it so you just take whatever is available to you in the sense 
if there's a favorable finding and that it entitles you to an to, 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 you know, to, to a defense, namely that what was used need not be what was found as a result of examining the samples, that's good enough for you. So keep this in mind that when you're cross-examining a witness, you have to be ultra careful. Then another uh, tip that would be that you always gauge the caliber of your witness. Sometimes if you want to take a little bit of a chance and you find that that person is not really up to the mark, or for that matter, your opposition is somebody who is who's a little wanting in his, in his uh, efforts, etc. It's worth taking a chance, a bit of a chance. Now, this was one of those very early trials that I had, which I was led by somebody. Very interesting. This was a case where my client was accused of cheating. Now, cheating, you know, the ingredients of cheating is that when you deceive someone into doing something which he would not otherwise have done and make him part with something, some money, etc. in your favor. So in this case, what had happened was that my client had made a proposal to some executive of a big company that if you do such and such a thing, you would get some benefits from the government in terms of sales tax, etc. I don't remember the exact details of the matter. But he induced them to enter into a contract with him. Now that never worked out because had to say my client never intended to keep his word, but the fact of the matter is that that contract went away. They, they parted with money. That money never saw the uh, there were no goods returned in, in exchange for that. So he didn't fulfill his part of the promise. Now when the matter went to trial, our defense was that no, you have not been cheated. Because when this proposal was made to you, this proposal was made to you with your eyes open, and you have consulted your lawyer before entering into this contract with my client. That was going to be our defense. Now, this witness, I must say, uh, an executive, very well dressed. Normally, one of the ways to impress the judge is to dress properly. And naturally, you know, that, that, that's a weakness of most judges when they see someone properly attired, etc. They know that this is a man. And we must respect him. So this person goes into the box and we were trying to prove that he had consulted his lawyer. Now, if he's consulted his lawyer, then he's not deceived. Then it could be a it could be just a matter of a civil trial or uh, a promise is not being performed. We got into cross-examining him and said that he had written a letter, which according to us we suspected was a letter written in consultation with his lawyer. Now he said, he came to the box, he says, no, I've written this letter myself, and uh, this was a response to this letter, and the other, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, when you write a letter, surely you understand the text of what you're writing? He says, yes. And I said, ordinarily, you wouldn't use phrases in your letter, the meaning of which you're not sure of, so I said, you confirm that you have used, that this letter is composed and written entirely by you. He said, yes, I confirm that. Now the letter used the word inter alia. You know, inter alia, amongst other things, as you know. So we still went out and asked, Mr. Sir, what does inter alia mean? Start looking all around. I said, yes. What does inter alia mean? I don't know. I said, therefore, if I show you in your letter that you have used the word inter alia, it means it's not your word, and we showed the letter. And the letter said inter alia this, that, and the other, which therefore was easy for us to argue thereafter that that was a word with an expression he had used in consultation with the lawyer. Now, if he's consulted a lawyer and entered into a transaction, he's not deceived, and we got the benefit of the doubt. So, therefore, this is one of the things that you keep in mind. Take advantage of the situation, but these opportunities come rarely. They're not going to come in every single trial of yours, because remember, more often than not, the witness is extremely informed 
as to where, where he is going, he is always alert, and therefore the direction in which you've taken has to be surely by your own efforts. Don't expect it to be quality on that. Finally, I'd like to say this that it's always advantageous in a cross examination to remain the boss of the show. Don't show ever that you're helpless or you don't know what's happening. It doesn't matter if you have to you know, put up a little bit of showmanship. Once again, there's a case which in, in arbitration. And uh, you ask, well, how come I, most of my trial work is in arbitration? I'll come to that in a little while. Uh, but this was a case where the witness, again, was one of those guys. Come, he, was a, he, he, he was a CEO of a big company. And absolutely assuring us, it was an extremely high stake arbitration, running into literally thousands of crores of rupees. So we had to cross examine this man. Somehow we were able to put him at his, you know, in that sense, get him a little jittery at some stage because we got him to admit that some of the answers that he had given were not very really quite, quite correct. So at one stage of the cross examination, he took the arbitrator's permission and uh, said, I want to move. May I be excused? I just want to use the washroom. I noticed that there was a bit of nervousness in his tone. So the judge looked, the arbitrator looked at me and said, that's fine. He goes out. So the judge said, let's take a five minute break. So in that break, I also got up and to the washroom. There outside, I see him on his cell phone talking to somebody. I ignored him, went past, came back. 15 minutes or 20 minutes later, in the same cross examination, again he looks to the architect and says, oh, Can I take another break? A few minutes. And the architect looked at me, now if someone has to go to the washroom, you can't say, Don't go. You have to go. You have to go. Mm -hmm. He look. So then he looked at the architect and looked look in my direction, shrugged my shoulder, and I said, Yes. Let him go, but let him leave his phone cell phone behind. So, okay. So this guy says, the witness is that. So, what do you think? I'm going to use my cell phone outside in my. I said, that's precisely what you're going to do. You did it the last time, there's nothing to prevent you from doing it again. Leave your cell phone, otherwise, I'm not consenting to pay. Now, the idea is this this was a bit of showmanship on my part, I must confess. But, it pays huge dividends if the opportunity presents itself. Now, you see, some of these tips that I'm giving you are just out of sheer experience, having been uh, in the profession for all this while. But they are worth keeping in mind because you never know when it will come to you. That's exactly how I learned my cross examination also, just watching people, watching some real giants in the profession. And you pick up these little, little tidbits. And this is one advice that I would give you when you now get your standard or just end the process. I believe you also have the system of internship, right? Now, don't you waste that opportunity. It's a godsend. We never had it in our days. When you're an intern with a law firm, spend your time in courts. If you intend to take up active practice as a lawyer, spend your time in courts. Just observe. You'll be amazed, especially with the knowledge that you imbibe, how that knowledge unfolds, how those provisions of law actually come to life in a court of law is something which only comes through experience. This is something. Now, once again, as I told you that many of my illustrations are in the area of arbitration. Why? Because unfortunately, I, uh, in a civil matter, in civil trials, a case comes up after 20 or 30 years, as you do in this system of ours. Now, when you ask an inconvenient question to a client, to a witness after 20, 25 years, he would turn around and say, I can't remember. Happened so far back. Now, usually a judge will accept that if something happened 20 years ago. It's quite probable that you have forgotten about it, that you can't remember. So, therefore, it's an escape route for a witness in civil trials, less so in criminal trials, but once again, 
our system doesn't really lend itself. It does give this excuse for plan because even criminal trials can come up after years and years. So this excuse is really clear. But not in arbitration. In arbitration, the dispute has to be referred to arbitration as soon as the time is right, which could be a year, year and a half, two years. And this escape route is not available to a witness over there because he can't run away by saying, I can't remember. Now, you may be, he may be lying when he says after 20 years that I can't remember, but there's no way to establish that lie because you can't get into his mind. So these are some of the difficulties. But I'll tell you, it's, it's really, I mean, most people get into this whole into the area of law built on the romance of cross-examination. You must have seen in your movies how it can reduce a witness to pulp. Now, when I say movies, I don't mean Hollywood movies. <laughs> Just about anything happens, a judge becomes a witness, a witness becomes a, and then you get, so it's all interchangeable there. I'm talking about sensible movies where this one, and this romance of cross-examination is frankly what probably enticed me as well to get into this profession. It is a worthy profession, it's a profession by which you can really serve society as long as you keep your integrity and industry intact. Thank you very much. I have two questions. I have two questions, sir. Sure. One is, are they cross cross examination questions? No. Uh, my first question is, uh, there is quite likelihood that the client tends to be dishonest. Or what is the likelihood, I would say, or what is the likelihood? Again, I'm putting an open ended question and not a direct link question. So, what is the likelihood that, uh, from your experience, you feel that the client, when he's greeting you, is greeting a dishonest, uh, or he's not honest to you because he wants to make himself, you know, covered up before even you, the case comes on trial? That is my first question. Let me answer that. It's a very good question. Let me answer that first before your second question. One is, from the client's point of view, if he is lying to you and dishonest to you, he's being actually unfair to himself because you can't put your best foot forward. His lie will be exposed by your opponent. And remember, every opponent of yours is as clever, if not cleverer than you. So don't think you can run away with it. He's being unfair to himself if he doesn't come out with the truth. The other thing is this, the other aspect of this is that you, listen, you are concerned as a lawyer with instructions. You don't get into, is it true, is it not true? He pays the price. If his instructions to you are premised on a falsehood, sooner or later it will be exposed by the other side. There is no doubt about that. So therefore, but you can't sit in judgment and come to your own conclusion that this is not correct, this is correct. But what you can do as a lawyer is this, that if you know it to be false, you will not participate in that false. If, for instance, you know that a certain letter which is given to you is a forged letter, you are within your rights not to tender that letter to the court as a genuine letter. That you will not be. So there are two aspects to it. One, don't be judgmental. Take instructions as they come, it will be at his own peril. You may tell him that, listen, you'll be doing yourself a favor by telling me what happened. But if he wants to keep it to himself, he's digging his own grave. But once you know for a fact that he is fabricated documents, then it is no part of your duty to advance that fabrication to a court because your duty to the court is much higher than your duty to your client. Thank you. My second question is. Uh, uh, generally, we see that the clients, whether civil, they tend to be three to five years and sometimes ten years, or criminal trials they run into ten plus years, uh, which is one of the prime reasons of so many cases pending in our courts, five roads, as we learned last time. Now, 
in this cross examination, the age of the witness matters to some extent when there are very critical information is to be extracted from such witnesses, and that critical information is so critical to our case from the argument perspective. Now, if these cases run into so many years, don't you think this actually puts a limitation, especially on the dependent side? Could be. Uh, see, first of all, uh, we are we stuck with the system. There's nothing you can do to play within the system. But I'm not quite sure of what you're trying to convey. If the, first of all, your cross-examination must necessarily depend upon what you are being instructed by your client. It has nothing to do with what the other side is going to. You're not, you're, when in, in, in cross-examining a witness, you're not eliciting information from him. You're not, in that sense, as I said, in the very beginning, learning from him. You're taking him where you want to take him. That is the whole purpose of cross-examination. You get your instruction from your client, and he says, such and such a thing is happening. Now, what has happened is according to your client, what is the direction in which you will take that witness or a series of witness to establish your client's defense or his, uh, it, you know, it, it, his case? That's how it is. We really are one set not concerned with the other side, what the other side has to say. What the other side has to say, if you want to expose him, then it has to be on the basis of the information that your client has given. My question is particularly pertaining to a situation wherein I do not remember, I do not know, because so many years have passed by, is a defense which is admitted in court and not in arbitration. From that perspective, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult situation that I told you, that sometimes a person's failing memory, if it's accepted by the court, it, it can't be helped. And look, this is an escape route. That's, that's really one of the weaknesses of our system. You can't have something coming up after 20, 25 years. Most of, more often than not, the litigants are dead. The, the plaintiff is dead. The, his, the person who it steps into his shoes may either lose interest or the value of money 20 years ago may not be the same right now. So these are circumstances. There's nothing you can do about it. That's what you need. That's what all, all you guys must really get into the profession and revitalize it. And most of you must, or at least half of you must become judges. So you know, we are we are so terribly short of judges right now. We are restraining. You know, take Bombay, for instance, the hub, uh, our uh, financial hub of the country. We have a strength of 94 judges, and uh, an allotted strength of 94 judges, but you have only 63 right now. We're working to two thirds, and the strength. Once I was uh, going to Delhi for a hearing, and I happened to be sitting alongside a former judge of the Supreme Court. And got into conversation. And uh, so I asked him, I said, Look, Judge, you know, this you have in the Supreme Court 65, 70 matters listed on a particular day. I mean, how do you get yourself familiar? Do you know what he told me? He says, The laziest judge of the Supreme Court works 14 hours a day. The laziest judge. He says, Sometimes we don't sleep more than two or three hours. It can't be helped if you have that passion for judges. And you can't put them through, through further strain by not creating. And that's really one of the things. Our judge to population ratio in this country is the worst in the world of any democratic country. It's the worst. And I sad to say, but your politicians don't, don't uh, awaken to this reality. It is you, you, you have to have a robust judiciary. Therefore, when I address a class or a classroom, I mean, it just does energize me to feel good because you are really the future. I'm not a student in college, I'm just a student of the law. I just want to ask one thing. Uh, how do you conduct yourself when uh, your witness answers a question in a way which you had never even possibly imagined? That a witness could come up with a question, but could come up with an answer like that, and which will in fact harm your case too. Well, more often than not, it comes that such a situation arises if you haven't done your own work. Like I said, you never ask a question, the answer of which you don't know. I'm not there to learn from the witness. I don't want to improve my general knowledge from him. So therefore, if I get an answer from him, 
which I didn't expect, the fault more often than not is mine. Of course, it can happen that you ignore or you something, maybe your client has not given me fuller instructions, or you have ignored an important aspect, but that's a human failing. But by and large, such a situation should never come up, should never crop up. But thank you very much. Sorry, I heard one more. I hope these questions are inspired by my talk. So you have cited the example of God on the path. Uh, uh, similar example if you can cite from your career, where it, uh, just to uh, extension of the question was there are. Yes, I have done my homework. I know what the leading questions are. I, I, I know what I'm, where I'm going to be supposed to go. But the witness is such a, or such, uh, by, by whatever way in fact, that I'm not able to get that answer. And I'm at a certain stage that I'm quite sure that this is the way I want to lead to. So can you cite such a, some case in your career where in this situation happened? Um, well, I mean, the, the case about the son murdering, uh, this is it's one such instance where you get teeth like this. Uh, sorry, I, I may repeat what I said earlier. It's for you to assess that if you get enough material on the basis of which you, you think you can advance an argument, it's prudent to keep quiet at that. Then you take, yes, you may not get the answer to your liking, but if it can sustain an argument, then that's the best time to stop. Don't push your luck. It's not a matter of luck. Ultimately, each party, the other side as well as your client, knows what the truth is. The truth is known only to these two people. We are guessing. At best, we are guessing. And I, I, I keep feeling this way, you know, that, uh, that look, your plans will fit to you. The other side will fit to his way. And therefore, the judge has to decide who the better paper is. That's, I mean, that's his role. And both sides, you know, each side is obviously protecting his own interests and coming up with only half of his point of truth. But he has to then decide who fits better. That's the, that's the system, unfortunately. And all that would be obviated if we had good trials. That we don't have. Thank you again very much. Thank you, sir. I would now try to request Rushi Jane to give the vote of On behalf of DMA School of Law, I thank Mr. Harish Kirtani for taking out, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule and enlightening us with your profound knowledge. The principles of cross-examination will definitely help us in our career. Your talk on, uh, your talk has increased our knowledge on how evidence is also important and cross-examination refers to nature. nature. After listening to you, we can definitely say that cross-examination is not enough. It's an art and not a piece. Thank you so much. I now request Arimara to stand for the national anthem. Thank <laughs> you. 